Welcome to You Shall Wear Books Club. This is the fifth in our series and you can find out more details about the whole series on our Eventbrite page and I'm going to put that in the chat for you now. Today we are going to hear about women owners and women producers of UCL's Rare Books collection. And I'm going to explain to you very briefly how we have come to be focusing on this topic today. UCL, as many of you will know, was founded in the early 1800s and much of our special collections of archives, rare books and, and records reflect the white, wealthy European 19th century men who very generously donated their libraries and their collections to University College London. The canon of the curriculum has tended to repeat those characteristics in the titles from those collections that have received visibility. As my colleague Erica Delbeck, who is head of rare books at UCL, has pointed out, these characteristics relate to almost every single item in the recent Treasures from UCL book, which is a wonderful book, and I shall put that in the chat as well. But this presents us with uh, something of a dilemma. Do we have less visible voices and subjects in the collections? And if we do, how can we help to promote these? And how can we tie those in to our very small acquisitions budget and the way we might have the opportunity to develop the collections in the future? So in 2019, a colleague, Chris Fripp, and I started in a very small way, a little pilot. We made an Excel spreadsheet of uh, women written by, of rare books written by women, or bound by women, or illustrated by women, or owned by women. And we ended up with a very long list already. This built on a, an initiative that has been uh, running for some years at UCL called um, Liberating the Curriculum and I've put a little link to that in the chat and that's to address ideas of, an, of the issue of an inclusive curriculum for the taught courses at the university and we also wanted to tie into UCL's equality, diversity and inclusion policies and initiatives. So moving to 2020 and library services as a whole was looking at how we as, as a, a series of libraries can contribute with a project called Liberating the Collections and there are many different initiatives taking place at the moment at UCL Library Services. Here in Special Collections we were also challenged by trying to find opportunities for our volunteers that could take place purely online. And I'm very grateful to Erica Delbeck, our Head of Rare Books, for uh, picking up this project and to all the other curators and staff who have contributed to it. Um, Harriet Hale, our Rare Books uh, cataloguer, Vanessa Friedman and Liz Laws, who are two of our subject librarians, Vicky Price, who runs our outreach programme, and Sarah Pipkin, our outreach assistant. I um, might have forgotten some people, in which case I'm sorry. We started with the Rare Books because that was a project that could start with volunteers using the online catalogue. So nothing you're going to hear about today is literally hidden in the sense that you can access it for free as a member of the public from our online library catalogue. And I've put the link to that in the chat. But that doesn't mean that we use these items in our teaching, our exhibitions, our events, our digitization and our outreach and that's what we're aiming to do. We got 90 people interested in the project, we took 15 on, we have several strands, women, race and colour, non-mainstream religions, non-European people and cultures, same-sex love and de desire and LGBTQIA plus content and authors and social deprivation and poverty. And we wanted our volunteers to identify catalogued items by looking at printers, binders, illustrators, uh, publishers, 
those who produce the books, at writers and perspectives, at subject areas and representations and content, and at owners. Now, the first phase of our project is really still just winding up. So it's going to be a little while before we have a chance to evaluate the project and to publicise the first um, findings. But do look out for our volunteers writing pieces in our blog and I've put the link to that in the chat. But for today and next week, we're going to hear from some of our volunteers in the Women's Strand. And we start off with Dr Steph Carter, who is a postdoctoral associate researcher at Newcastle University. She's studying for an MLIT in archives management at the University of Dundee and her PhD in her research has been on book ownership and on musical literacy and the commercial music trade in early modern England. But today she's going to talk about the items that she has identified uh, pre-1750 and I'm handing over now to uh, Steph if you'd like to switch your camera and your microphone on. Over to you, Steph. Super. Thank you so much, Tabitha, for your introduction. Um, I'm just going to share screen. And I'm hoping that you can all see that. Right. That so, oh, wonderful. Thank you, Tabitha. Great. So, um, yes, as... Oh, as Tabitha said, today I'm going to be talking about women owners um, of UCL's pre-1750 rare books. So um, Tabitha gave a great introduction to the Liberating uh, the Curriculum project, and uh, this special collections project has brought attention to, among others, women owners in the university's library collection. And this has been possible partly because of the rise in scholarship around marginalised groups those on the periphery of the standard white male British canon. Such scholarship in the last 40 odd years has included explorations of female book owners, as well as women authors, readers, and members of the printed book trade. For women book owners, the early modern female book ownership blog and David Pearson's book owners um, online database, both provide accessible and constantly updated data banks informing users of the often scant information about the women's lives and their book collections. These online resources contribute to the growing body of published literature around women and books, including the article on women and their books in 17th century England by David McKittrick, the edited collection of essays, women's bookscapes in early modern Britain, and most recently, a chapter focusing on women owners in David Pearson's monograph, Book Ownership in Stuart, England. The project at UCL contributes to our growing interest and in narrative of women book owners, ultimately making the books more visible for teaching and research purposes, and providing the basis from which, to borrow William Sherman's words, to liberate women from their long period of textual house arrest. My role in the project was to identify women book owners from the detailed provenance statements in the Special Collections um, catalogue. And my intention today is to show you some examples of what I found. Of course, material traces of women's ownership and reading of books includes not only ownership inscriptions and book plates, but also marginalia, library and probate inventories, as well as diaries and letters. But working primarily with the UCL catalogue, my research focused on inscriptions and book plates. And I looked through over 5,000 provenance statements, only a small fraction of the collection at UCL, and I discovered about 100 references that I could identify as women owners. Of course, a significant amount more provenance markings only provide initials, making gender identification practically impossible. So having identified books in the catalogue containing evidence of women ownership, next came the tricky question of who was she? Research has been primarily online due to the COVID lockdown, but has brought to the fore the intensely acute disparity between men and women when it comes to documentation and searching for biographical details. Bi biographies of women tend to be tied into the biographies of their fathers or husbands or brothers, and typically comprising little more than their wedding date and how many children they bore. To illustrate this point, although a little later than the time period in question, 
in the UCL collection is the two volume A History of British Birds by Thomas Buick. This is a later edition dated 1805 and the two books contain joint inscriptions. The bookplate of Edmund Leopold Lockyer, but also contains the autograph on the title page of Eliza Lockyer. Now Edmund Lockyer was probably the doctor um, dated 1782 to 1816, who studied geology, botany, and chemistry, lived in Plymouth where he was mayor in 1810 and a founder of Plymouth Library. But all we know um, of Elizabeth is that Edmund married an Elizabeth Braithwaite in 1809. There are also multiple questions to be asked about this distinct dual ownership of the book. Did it belong to Elizabeth but was incorporated into Edmund's library after their marriage? Or was it already in Edmund's collection but gifted to Elizabeth or predominantly used by Elizabeth to such an extent that she felt it necessary to ascribe ownership over it? <clears throat> Excuse me. Other examples in the UCL catalogue provide evidence of distinctly joint ownership of books. The Francis and Mary Small, their book, 1720, and Steph, presumably Stephen, and Hannah Carling, their book. Another earlier example from the UCL collection is this Hebrew text from around 1687 or 88, belonging to Rebecca Makata, with her name inscribed on the binding verse. This is undoubtedly part of the Makata Library, jointly founded by UCL and the Jewish Historical Society of England in 1906, although the majority of the Makata collection was destroyed by bombing in 1940. A Makata family history is detailed on the DMB, and the earliest reference to the family in England is the merchant and diamond broker Moses Makata, who was residing in London from Amsterdam by 1671. And here's a family tree showing some of the Makata family members from Moses onwards, which I've taken from the Jewish um, Encyclopedia online. Moses was the start of a long standing, respectable London Jewish family. In the late 19th century, for instance, Frederick Makata was chairman of the synagogue and Charles Makata was the first president of the Hebrew Choral Association under the patronage of the Rothschild family. And the music volumes held in the Makata Library have been identified and discussed elsewhere. <clears throat> but re returning to Moses Makata, at his death in 1693, Moses identifies a niece called Rebecca. His son, Abraham, later became a broker to the Bank of England and had a daughter named Rebecca. Beyond the UCL item, two further books, a Spanish text published in Amsterdam in 1676 and a Spanish Bible printed in Amsterdam in 1718, belonging to a Rebecca Makata, are known and were listed in a sales catalogue of the Jews College Library in 2003. It is not clear if all three books belong to the same later Rebecca, or if the two 17th century books belonged to the niece. However, the UCL book at least clearly remains in the Makata family collection until at least the early 19th century, as there are manuscript notes on the, on the front fly leaves detailing information about births in the family between 1797 and 1809. And I've just given you an example there um, in the top right hand corner. So we may have brief biographical details for women owners in the early modern period, and the books ascribed as belonging to them, but often little else is known about their lives. This, is, this can even be the case for many aristocratic and gentry women who probably had private spaces in their affluent houses to read and use books, but their book collections have long been dispersed and their reading habits undocumented. Another example is Robert Burns's self-published poems, chiefly in the Scottish dialect, published in Edinburgh in 1787, owned by Eliz Lady Elizabeth Colville. Probably the Lady um, Colville, originally Elizabeth Ford, shown here, who married the ninth Lord Colville of Colross in 1790. For other inscriptions, it is not clear which family member, uh, sorry, which female member of the family is referred to with first names repeated through generations. For example, John Spottiswood's The History of the Church in Scotland, printed in 1655, contains a book plate um, belonging to Viscountess Scudamore. This may refer to Lady Frances Cecil, who was to marry the second Viscount Scudamore in 1672. 
who was uh, described as the impudinist woman who eloped with a Mr. Collingsby. But it's more probably Francis Digby, who married the third Viscount Scudamore in 1707, um, who was known as a book owner, and Pope Circle would reside at their residence, Holm Lacey, between Hereford and Ross on Wye. And here I've shown you a picture of the, um, the third Viscountess, the, the second Francis, um, with an image of the house uh, drawn uh, around 1875, but the building was completed by the first Viscount in 1674. I've also shown you here a picture of uh, an illustration from um, the 1717 edition of Ovid's Metamorphoses. Um, each of the 15 books of this edition included a full page engraving at the start, each dedicated to a noblewoman or woman of society. And the illustration in the 10th book shown here is dedicated to this Viscountess Scudamore. The extent of her library is unknown and according to David Pearson, her book plate was made after her husband's death in 1716. An interesting fact in itself, were books in the Holm Lacey at Holm Lacey deemed first and foremost belonging to the Viscount? Or did Francis only begin collecting after her husband's death? Or was it not until after his death that Francis felt able to ascribe ownership to books? Of course, there are examples in the UCL collection of women book owners for whom we currently know nothing about. Mary Makin is inscribed on signature A3 of a 1620 edition of the works of the Roman philosopher Luce, Lucius Seneca. Anne Heather, her book, dated 1668 and 1670, in a 1631 edition of Sir Richard Barclay's The Felicity of Man. Mary Heathcote, which you can see here, is inscribed in the last leaf folio of a 1612 edition of The Heroic Life and Deplorable Death of the Most Christian King Henry IV. And Elizabeth Rowe Walton, again shown here, is inscribed on the title page of a 1784 edition of a short introduction to English grammar. However, it is not all bad news. Two books in the UCL collection were owned by a later book collection, book, book collector Francis Curra. And those are George Paul's The Life of the Reverend and Religious Prelate John Whitgift, dated from 1612, and Jane Marsett's Conversations on Chemistry, dated 1828. Two books that illustrate antiquarian book collecting by a 19th century lady who also owned books by women authors. Curra was an heiress and a book collector whose library was kept at Eshton Hall in Yorkshire, which you can see here. And I've given you, uh, I found these engravings. The top one is of the library and the bottom one is of the drawing room. And you can see that both of them are absolutely stacked full of books. At the time, Dibden considered her the head of all female collectors in Europe and that her library was in its day surpassed only by those of Earl Spencer, the Duke of Devonshire and the Duke of Buckingham. She owned the Marset book by the time of the second edition of a catalogue of her library was produced in 1833, but I haven't been able to check the original 1820 catalogue as to whether she owned the 17th century book by then. The library was particularly rich in natural science, topography, antiquities, history and classics, and Curra was on the fringe of the Bronte world. Her collection was sold after her death at Sotheby's in 1862 and 1916, fetching almost £10,000 altogether, and additional sales occurred in the 1970s and 90s. And books have survived not only at UCL, but also at least at the Folger Shakespeare Library. So from the great bibliophiles through to women we know nothing about apart from their names, the UCL collection also holds a number of books with evidence of ownership by multiple women, possibly indicating books being passed down through female generations of the family, described elsewhere as carriers of relationships. This example shows a Mary Rich and Margaret Rich, both ascribed their names on the title page of Orlando Furioso, the original 1591 edition translated by Sir John Harrington. This is an Italian poem that was a source for Much Ado About Nothing, and Harrington's edition was apparently demanded by his godmother, Elizabeth I. 
Several copies were produced as presentation copies for potential patrons and court. The British Library, for instance, holds William Cecil's copy in which three of the sex scenes have been blacked out by hand. Lady Anne Clifford is also thought to have owned a later edition of Harrington's translation, although the book is lost. It's not clear who the two rich women of the UCL copy are, but an inscription on page 186 refers to a note on the marriage of Robert and Elizabeth Rich in 1616. So the book was owned soon after its publication. Could it have been one of Harrington's presentation copies? And it also passed between female members of the Rich family. Now, Mary Rich may refer to the known author and book owner, the Countess of Warwick. Her manuscript diaries survive detailing her reading habits in her closet over an 11 year period. However, I'm unaware of any comprehensive study of Rich's diaries beyond references in Andrew Camber's godly reading. Mary was apparently addicted to plays and romances in her youth. However, I've been unable to find a Margaret Rich in this family or marriage between a Robert and Elizabeth Rich in 1616. So these inscriptions may refer to a completely separate family. Provenance notes by the later owner, Charles K. Ogden survive alongside the book, indicating that Ogden was similarly confused by the inscriptions in this book and that he was unable to clarify the owners, but presumably Mary Rich referred, that he, sorry, presumed that Mary Rich referred to the Countess of Warwick. Another example in the UCL collection of books passing between female family members is a mirror of magist magistrates from 1610 with inscriptions on the title page by Mary Javeau, but it is Catherine Javeau's book in 1678, and then Richard Javeau, his book in 1685. And this may re relate to the Javeau family of Hampshire, where Thomas Javeau in the late um, 17th century was MP and High Sheriff of Hampshire and had married a Mary Purfoy in 1657 and had two sons and four daughters. There's a large family archive held at Hampshire Archives, which unfortunately, because of COVID, I've been unable um, to explore. What I've shown you here, um, these three images relate to uh, a volume of five devotional books in the UCL catalogue pub published in the 1610s, and is certainly another carrier of relationships providing evidence of multiple women owners. Ur Ursula Mishet and Mary Gill, her book 1708. Do these inscriptions hint at unclear familial ties or lost friendship connections, or perhaps evidence of women interacting with the secondhand book trade? We don't know. The books discussed today convey the common profile of women book owners during this period. They are almost all in English, and they are largely theological or devotional with some recreational and educational examples. They are also all examples that help to push beyond the idea that books belonged only to men and contribute to our narrative of women book owners that extends into the 19th and 20th centuries. One 19th century example of a woman book owner in the UCL collection is the copy of John McCulloch's 1825, The Principles of Political Economy, ascribed by Caroline Darwin. <clears throat> Caroline may be best known by historians today as the elder sister of Charles Darwin and the grandmother of Ralph Vaughan Williams, but the Darwin Correspondence Project has highlighted numerous letters between Caroline and her brother Charles, clearly demonstrating an active interest in Charles's work, and she, she sends books to Charles during his travels, and Charles likewise sent, sent his finished journals back to Caroline for the family to read. And she is pictured here at age 16, already with book in hand. The remote nature of the UCL liberating the curriculum project during COVID-19 has meant that while identification of women book owners has been possible by the publicly accessible detailed catalogue, it has not been possible to explore whether or not there is evidence that these women owners actually read their books. Although it should not be forgotten that it wasn't too long ago that libraries would prefer to collect neat, clean copies of books and that the survival of flawless and evidently unused books have been linked with the contemporary culture of collecting luxury material goods and the rise in antiquarianism. Certainly, the UCL catalogue has not included any records of reading, that is, if such evidence exists. However, what I hope to have provided today is one small contribution to what the editors of Women's Bookscapes in Early Modern England describe 
is the myriad ways in which women bought, borrowed, accessed, wrote in, made, recorded, cited, and circulated books. An appreciation of women's engagements with books continues to increase, in part thanks to projects such as the one at UCL. Thank you very much, and back to Tabitha. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Whoops, that's better, isn't it? Thank you very much indeed, Steph, for that fantastic presentation of your findings. Um, there's lots and lots of questions that I have in my mind, and I'm sure there'll be many of you out there with questions. But we're going to go straight on now to the second talk, and then we'll have time for discussions just before two o'clock. You're welcome to leave at two or you can stay with us if you're available until 2.30 and we'll have a bit of a discussion. I've put the links to a few of the items Steph mentioned. The catalogue record links are in the chat and we've got a question for the Rebecca McAfter book and I'll work on laying my hands on that catalogue link in just a minute. But now I'm going to introduce you to our second speaker who is Sarah D'Amico. And uh, Sarah is has in fact, I think, just done her last exam for a master's in library sciences at uh, La Sapienza University in Rome. And we're very uh, grateful to Sara for joining us from Italy today. Um, her first degree was in archeology span and history of art. And um, she is going to talk about women owners and producers of our Italian collections. Um, Sara, I'm going to hand over to you now. So if you switch your camera on, excellent. There we go. Over to you, Sara. Thank you, Tabitha, for the introduction. I'm just going to share my screen now. If you can see the presentation. Um, well, hello, everyone. Uh, like Tabitha mentioned, I am another one of the volunteers for the Liberating the Collections uh, project. And my focus was women in the Italian book trade, which has been extremely challenging and interesting uh, since I didn't have any limitations um, regarding time periods. I have found a great variety of professional figures of women operating in a span of time from the 16th to the 20th century. So today I'm not just presenting the most interesting of my findings, but also all the issues and problems that I had to face by working solely on a library catalog, since again, this project was done um, remotely. So I only had access to the records of the UCL Special Collections Library. So the very first, um, I obviously, the very first research <laughs> came uh, results came from the Castiglione collection and the Dante collection. These are the biggest Italian collections in UCL special collections, and I have gone through them record by record for a total of about 500 items, searching and scanning for women's names. And if you can read the title page and the colophon of the two books in my uh, slide, you can see immediately that there are no women's and female names in these pages. And that's why the two women printers I have encountered, um, Lukina Ravani and Lavinia Komarek, didn't actually put their names on the editions they printed. So they this was the very first issue I've had to face since based solely on the library record, which obviously uh, reports everything that is written on the book, I wouldn't have found the, a woman's name and I would have just moved on. So uh, thankfully I got curious and I had resorted to external sources. So for Lucina Ravani, since she operated in Venice in the 16th century, I immediately turned to Edit 16, a very precious database for all editions printed in Italy in the 16th century. And that's where I found that Vittor de Rabani, whose name is actually on the edition, was Lucina's son. And she actually worked alongside her son. Um, you can see in the colophon it's written per Vittor de Rabani e compagni, that means printed by Vittor de Rabani and partners. 
So these partners are never mentioned by name, but we know that in, they included his mother. And the presence of a woman printer is not as rare as one may, may think, because women ever since the uh, 16th century have, um, have had to print uh, often after their husbands died. So widows of printers weren't that rare, but they usually signed the editions as widows of and the name of, her, of their husbands, which is not something that happens here. And uh, most importantly, most of the times, these women would stop printing once their children came of age and could take over the business, which again is something that did not happen with Lucina Ravani since she kept working alongside her son, even though she's not she's never mentioned. So I find Lucina mentioned for the first time on Edit 16, and I've done some um, additional research, and I've discovered that there are some documents in the State Archive of Venice stating that she actually owned the printing press and she's the one who received the permission from the city of Venice to print, il privilegio di stampa. That means she must have had some kind of agency, but it's difficult, if not impossible, to say how much uh, she influenced her son's decisions and how many of those decisions were actually hers, since Printing was not a one man's job, it was a group effort. So it's difficult to establish what Lukina's role was in the uh, process of printing. A very similar situation uh, I've encountered with Lavinia Komarek, which is another woman printer who operated in Rome in the 18th century. So we are talking about two women operating in two different towns of Italy and 200 years apart but their stories are very much similar. And that obviously indicates how little it, uh, the situation for women printers changed over the centuries. So Lavinia, like Lucina, was a widow of a printer and she operated the printing press until her son came of age and she also printed after her son died. Again, there's no name, not even widow of Komarek, who, who was um, her husband. In fact, all of Giovanni Komarek's successors uh, printed under the um, expression Nella Stamperia del Komarek. So they never used their names. They only ever printed under the expression from the, print, the Komarek printing press, which of course makes it very difficult to identify which member of the family was actually behind that particular edition. If it was Lavinia, if it was her son, or in fact, her two daughters, who also we know published something, but it's difficult to determine who printed what. And especially just by looking at library records, we never would have guessed that a woman was behind that edition. So that was the very first um, step I had to make. So resort to external sources by um, starting from the library catalog. I've also obviously encountered a lot of book, uh, women book owners. I won't talk too much about them since uh, Dr. Steph Carter has done an amazing job covering the subject, but I wanted to present another interesting case that also presents um, and illustrates what happens when we have a very detailed library record, but um, and, and it still leaves some information out. For instance, this woman owner was Helena Savilfose, a very famous actress, who in fact signed the book, you can see in the images, three times. So there are three ownership inscriptions, but in the library records, it's only registered one. And that's the one you can see on the right corner of the slide, Helen Fosse, even a misspelled version of her name, and uh, it was on the half title of the book, so at the very beginning of the book. Likely, um, Tabitha provided the images, the scanned images for the book, and I was able to see that um, other pages of the book also had ownership inscriptions. So there's one on the title page, and most importantly, there is another one on the beginning of the Inferno, since the book Helena owned was a translation of Dante's Inferno in the Dante collection. 
And this is important because she not only signed her name in the book, but she put a date, 1835. Now, by just looking at the library record without this date and any additional information, I assumed that she owned this book. Um, she might have bought it or received it as a gift, but she owned it in result of her marriage with Sir Theodore Martin, which made her Lady Martin. Sir Theodore Martin was a Dante translator, so my first assumption was that Helena in, uh, developed an interest in Dante after marrying her husband. But this date changes it because she married Sir Theodore Martin in 1851. So this book proves that she had an interest in Dante long before her, her marriage, so uh, long before meeting Sir Theodore Martin, a Dante translator. Also, I have found some evidence of readership, some manuscript annotations and underlinings of passages she must have particularly liked, which again is not in the library record. So without this additional information, without having the book at hand, or in this case, hand images of the book, I wouldn't have been able to determine if she read the book other than simply owning it because ownership doesn't necessarily mean readership. I have also found a woman book collector or alleged book collector that is Caroline Morris, whose library was bequeathed to the UCL Special Collections in 1869. Now, Caroline Morris presents a very interesting case because um, the Morris library was not kept intact um, in the UCL library. So the, their books, um, the, the books of James and Caroline Morris are scattered throughout all the special collections of UCL. There's a lot of them and I wasn't able to find them all yet, but I am working in reconstructing this library. What stri struck me about the records I found in the Dante collections was this expression this uh, from the library of James and Caroline Morris and it was particularly interesting because it's rare uh, to find a library co-owned by a husband and a wife. The library usually was owned by the husband by a man and family members had access to it that's not rare it's actually very common for family members to have access to a live private library and to use the books, but the ownership was also always the man, belonged to the man. In this case, however, I'm pretty sure that Caroline owned some of the books, or at least she used them extensively, because I was lucky enough to find some letters written to her and her husband by several scholars, friends, and family members. Again, this is something that I have discovered thanks to the help of uh, Tabitha and all the staff of the Special Collections and the Records Office of UCL that have helped me trace these letters in the library archive because there is no mention of them in the library record, even though all of the 15 letters written to uh, the Morrises were actually found inside the books. And then in a second moment, uh, they were taken out and preserved in the Captain the Archive. Thanks to these letters, I was able to reconstruct some of Caroline's interests and tastes, uh, such as her musical achievements and her interest in some of the, uh, in the books uh, that he, she either she or her husband or both of them owned, and also a, a particularly in a particular interest in women's rights and women's suffrage. Uh, you can see here a small quote taken from the um, letter that I put on the left side of the slide, which is addressed to my very dear sister by a certain J.M. Peebles, who writes to Caroline after her husband died, begging her to come back to the United States, where there's talk of women's suffrage and uh, the times are, uh, because the times were not right for her in England. So of course there's a lot more to discover, but I was lucky enough to find this link between the library and the archive that helped me shine some light on this uh, completely ignored woman, uh, book collect, woman book collector. 
And then I have found several women authors, which were a little bit easier to study since in all the cases that I have found, the names were um, stated in every uh, title of their books and in the records, so they were easy to identify. And in most cases, they were pretty well known. Like in this case, the most famous women authors I have encountered are the Rossetti sisters. Again, since I've been working on the Dante collection extensively, it makes sense for most, for a lot of the books to have been written by a member of the Rossetti family, whose name has always been linked to that of Dante during the 19th century. Cristina, Georgina, and Maria Francesca were, um, they were authors very well known for their works either in Cristina's case, they had her poetic works, and in Maria Francesca's case, her commentary and translation on Dante, and sometimes even on Petrarch. But this edition in particular is very interesting. It's an edition uh, printed in 1896 of, Fran of Maria Francesca Rossetti's Shadow of Dante, which was her most famous uh, work. This edition, in fact, belonged to two nuns, a sister Anna who conveyed the book from sister Susan. This, there is no way to prove it for sure, but it seems very likely that these nuns belonged to the same order as Maria Francesca Rossetti did. You can see from the image on the right, she was in fact a nun. She joined the All Saints for Sisters and she wrote a book this is an edition printed after her death, but it makes sense that she either gave, she kept some of her editions um, available for her sisters, and then her sister would keep on buying books written by her. And as we can see from the dates written, 1899 and 1911, they kept this tradition of passing the books to one another, down to one another. Finally, the most unexpected result was women engravers. I have found two of them, Sofia de Romelli and Elizabeth Crystal, and it was very much unexpected since women engravers are not very common in Italy. Um, and in fact, the two of them, despite Sofia's name, are not Italian. Sofia Giacomelli was in fact French. Her name was Sophie Genevieve Giacomelli uh, of Italian origins and married to an Italian man. But she was very famous, and uh, not only as a singer, but also as a graphic artist. She was widely known for her illustrations, her engravings of Dante's Divina Commedia, as you can see uh, from the copy in the UCL Special Collections, and of Milton's Paradise Lost. So Sophia was very widely known and appreciated as an artist. She was praised by journals, and that means that I found a lot of different sources mentioning her and praising her work. I have reported one in the slide. Um, it, this was a French journal printed in 1813 saying that the field of the arts is not foreign to women, which means that, um, in, at least in France, between the end of the, 18, of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century, women in the, in the field of arts were perhaps not common, but not as rare as we can imagine. Now, the same cannot be said for the second woman engraver, Elizabeth Crystal. In this case, in the case of the copy I have found uh, in the special collections, in the UCL special collections, she is a book owner. Uh, perhaps you can see in the slide on the right uh, corner, up corner, um, her signature, Elizabeth Crystal, dated 1851. But I know she was also an engraver herself, and she did um, most of the engravings of her brother's Joshua's paintings. And I think the fact that she had such a famous brother, the painter Joshua Crystal, may have influenced um, her contemporaries who basically they never paid her any attention. So she's been neglected by her contemporaries as well as by uh, future histor later historians since she is never mentioned in any source that I could find. She's always ever mentioned in link with her brother. 
I just wanted to show you some of Sophia's work. And I think that it's really interesting to put these two women in comparison and ask ourselves why they had such a different fate. Why was Sophia so highly praised by her contemporaries? Why was her name appearing in journals and academic um, studies? And why was Elizabeth completely overshadowed by her brother? Now, these are my top picks. I have found a lot of interesting women, but I hope I was able to show you how much information you can find in a library catalog while looking at uh, rare books, but also all the information that cannot be found for different reasons in a library catalog. Um, so you, you wouldn't able to read uh, them in any records and you would have to resort to external sources to find. So thanks again to Tabitha for the opportunity of working on the special collection and back to you. Thank you, Sara. That was another wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, so we now are going to have some questions and a bit of a discussion. We have opened the um, chat so if you open your chat panel at the bottom of the screen and set your chat to everyone uh, you can put your questions in there alternatively you can click the raised hand button if you like i just want to remind you that we are recording this um, and it would be fantastic to get um, you up if you want to switch your video on and you're happy to be in the recording. If you'd rather not show yourself in the recording, you can unmute yourself. So if you switch your video on now, you will be visible in the recording and we may post that on YouTube. So you, you might want to keep your, keep your video off and, unless you've got a question. Okay, so I'm going to pin um Steph and Sarah up here on the screen for you all and uh go ahead and stick your questions in the chat now we've got an interesting question from Vanessa um I don't know Vanessa if you want to um switch your camera on I can stick you up on the screen and Vanessa is our subject librarian for Hebrew and Jewish studies and curates our rare books and archives on that. Vanessa, go ahead. Yeah, it's a question for Steph. So it's actually not about the uh, the item from the Jewish collections, although that was very interesting to hear about Rebecca Makata. But you mentioned that Francis Cara had a connection with the Brontes. And I was wondering if there was any connection um, with Charlotte Bronte's pen name, which was Cara Bell. I have read that a, a few times. Um, Francis donated money to the um, clergy daughters school, which some of the Bronte sisters went to. Um, and so there has been, uh, yeah, some people say that, yeah, she, she may well have been the inspiration for that name, but uh, I'm not a Bronte expert, I'm afraid, sorry. <laughs> oh, it's just, uh, seemed an interesting coincidence otherwise. Thank you. Steph, did you, were you trying to say something? You were muted. Oh, sorry, I went muted for a moment there. I don't know why. I just said yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Vanessa. That, that's, that's a really fantastic um, suggestion. That's very exciting. Um, now, let, I'm just looking in the chat to see what other suggestions we have. Lots of thanks to both of you for these um, fantastic discoveries. So we've got some quite interesting questions that you both brought up about how we identify um, women authors, women printers, particularly Sarah, your examples, um, women owners. Um, now I know Sarah that you were presenting at your um, poster at the Universal Short Title Catalogue um, Gender and the Book Trades Conference a few weeks ago. Um, 
is there any is there any were there any suggestions there that you'd like to mention now i know there were some suggestions about tagging women in catalog records and so on yes thank you Tabitha. um most of the questions that i got were actually about women printers and particularly uh, the information where i got that information from and what more research could have been done about these two women in particular um, particular interesting seem to be Lukina Ravani from the 16th century. Um, I did mention briefly that there are a couple of documents related to, Lucky, to Lukina in the State Archive in Venice, and I wasn't able to see them in person or remotely via scans, but the Dizionario Treccani, which is the National Italian, um, the, the, the National Italian uh, dictionary of biography. Um, they did, uh, it was like, you know, Lucina was mentioned there, but there were a few quotes, a few lines taken out from those documents, which helped me realize she, she got the city's permission to print and she got the, uh, the address of the printing shop in her name. But there could be more in the archives, um, particularly maybe the will of her husband. Uh, something that's definitely there's more that has to come up so absolutely there is more to discover about these women that goes way beyond uh, a library catalog or even having the, the book at hand thank you and you've certainly both found a lot of information that we can now um put um to our cataloging team and make sure that we can enhance our records. We've got a question from uh, Nick Havely. Nick, it's up to you if you'd like to switch your video on, we can um, get you up on the screen or you can unmute yourself and just speak by audio. All right, thanks Tabitha and thanks to both for really a couple of very fascinating talks. Um, I've got um, a question for Sarah. Um, about um, it's about ownership by this um, actress wife of Theodore Martin of the Nathaniel Howard uh, translation of the of the Inferno. Um, I wondered if um, you would like you would uh, we could discuss this much more fully later. But um, you mentioned annotations. Um, did you find in in that translation? Did you find, uh, and you, you, you said, I think that this indicates clearly that she was reading it rather than just having possessed it, which uh, and it's, it's fascinating to follow those. Um, do you have any idea or, um, or any sense of what, what the most interesting annotations were for you? Thank you for that question. Um... Yes, so it's not heavily annotated. There's just um, some underlinings of some passages that I think would would be of interest to, to Elena. And I got one right here, yes. So it's basically just, um, I can show it, if I can share my screen maybe, if that agrees <laughs> to share yes, the go image. Ahead. Go ahead, you should be able to do that. Okay, perfect. There we go. I hope you can all see it. So this is one of the most evident piece of um, the proof of readership done by Elena. Of course, there's a part done in pencil, which I think was much later. Uh, but there is a part clearly made with the same pen that she signed her name with. And it's particularly interesting because she highlights a certain passage of the Inferno and then she puts a cross behind it. So I'm not entirely sure what that means. Usually highlighting um, some verses, some lines means that she was interested, but putting a cross among, um, on the side might mean that she either didn't particularly enjoy that or maybe she found some errors. So instead of correcting them, she might have put a cross um near them i'm not seeing anything particularly wrong with it but um i think that's one way to interpret it 
And unfortunately, there's not many more annotations, um, especially not manuscript annotations um, over comments, uh, just basically underlining of some passages. Nick, you're uh, you're muted at the moment. Yes, um, that that one is particularly interesting in that it's often quoted in terms of the quest for the idea of quest for fame. You know, mm -hmm. um, and you know, Helen, she was a famous actress, um, and uh, th this she'd be relatively early in her career, so that that might be an interesting you know reflection of the the nature of her reading. I was. You know, I was hoping, Sarah, you were going to say there were lots of annotations to Inferno 5, you know, um, uh, which of course is about the woman reader, Francesca, you know. Um, uh, but uh, you, you didn't notice any there, did you? No, unfortunately yeah. not. Okay, not. right. <laughs> yeah. Have you um, uh, I, right. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we can talk further about this later, but um, just one thing, perhaps for you both, for, for both, um, well, for actually for both Sarah and Tabitha, I don't know if you know, I'm afraid this is again from a Dantean point of view, um, did you know that UCL has a kind of connection with the very first uh, translation of the Convivio, of Dante's Convivio, which was by a woman? Oh, I do not know that. Right. Um, uh, it was by someone about whom very little is known. Um, there's a, a pioneering article by Anne Lawrence about uh, women readers of, uh, and, and translators of Dante. Um, and um, she said uh, this particular translator, Elizabeth Price Sayer, um, virtually nothing is known of her, but her translation appeared in the series um, that was edited by Henry Morley, who was um, a professor of English at U UCL uh, in the late 19th century. And, it's, and Anne Lawrence thinks that um, this translator, Elizabeth Price Sayer, uh, might have been a relative of Henry Morley's wife, who was uh, Mary Ann Sayer Morley. So there's, a, you know, might be interesting to see if that could be, I don't know if a copy of that is actually in the UCL collection, that it's 1887 uh, translation of Dante's Convivio by Elizabeth Price Sayer in the series of Morley's Universal Library. So that's, uh, you know, it, it might be, um, it, I just, uh, went back to the article this morning and I thought, no, suddenly saw this connection with UCL, um, but might be worth following up. Anyway, Nick, that, that, that's really fantastic. Thank you very much. And um, those of us who've done our library degrees at UCL know Henry Morley very well, mm -hmm. because um, until recently, the, the library and archives department was in the um, Morley building. So yes, that's great, if I've got that correct. Um, so that's super. We'll definitely go back and have a look and see if we have a copy. And that's a really good example of the way in which we hope to be able to act on the findings of our volunteers, because that might be something if we can find a copy that um, might not necessarily be very expensive, but something that we might be able to add to our collections if we don't already have a copy so that kind of way we'll we, we we hope that we're going to target not only the items that we already hold that we make visible but perhaps make up a little wish list that's not we hope going to be too expensive we have very very limited acquisitions budget but that that's very exciting thank you nick now we have quite a few comments i know some of you will need to leave so do feel free to um leave if you've got to go on for things um, we have a comment from uh, Jacqueline who is interested in Elizabeth Alsop who was a printer and publisher of cheap religious material and a widow of Bernard Alsop and she was um, publishing between 1653 and 1656 um, and Jacqueline is uh tracing a history of the interactive broadside the beginning progress and end of man which is a 1654 publication um 
Jacqueline, um, if you'd like to appear on the recording, you can. Oh, I did it get... one <laughs> Yeah, mm -hmm. you okay with that? I'm very poor at Zoom, getting worse as I teach more. Oh, here I am. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not comfortable being recorded, but anyway, it's very hot in Pennsylvania. Um, Jacqueline, so if you'd rather not be recorded, we can switch your video off. Is well, maybe I'll just turn off the video. Hi, I like to say hi, but I'll okay. just, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, the, um, I'm, I'm really interested in interactive materials and the beginning progress and end of man. I have this small project with no funding at all right now, um, tracing the printers and public, anything about this, this text. And um, Bernard Alsop, um, printed the first known one in four parts in 1650, and it's in the British Library as part of the Thomason collection. And then she printed the 1654 edition, which is five parts and has an added, an added panel. Like these are interactive things you lift up and down and it tells you what to do, how to lift it. And it starts with Adam and Eve and ends up with a skeleton. You know, and and um, the five part one that she printed has a Cain and Abel episode, but they all have a lion. They all have a lion that turns into an eagle and steals a baby, and they all have a young man who turns into a miser, and of course he get he gathers money. You know, they, there's a basic plot, you could say. But I'm I'm really interested in her and the fact that she did the longer one and with this added one, and that's and, and it's held at Harvard, at the Houghton. So, um, so I'm actually crazy about this text, which children copied and made and adapted and in England and America. And, you know, I sort of, every holiday I get myself off to a library, but I'm really, I'm so glad, I'm talking too much. I'm so glad to hear about this project about women printers, because first of all, just said Alislav, <clears throat> And everyone assumed it was the same person. And then I discovered it was like a different letter. And then who is that? And you go through the databases. So that's all I know is the basic stuff that you could get from afar. <laughs> so I was just wondering, um, I don't know, any helpful hints? Is there, I, I'd be happy to be a volunteer if I was useful. I, I specialize in children's literature, old children's literature. Okay, so um, an interactive book. So I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm just throwing this out. I'm so happy I got myself up on time with my coffee. Because <laughs> um, so is that too incoherent? Is there any? And I love the comparison to the Italian. Um, I thought, oh, of course, of course, it's cross cultural. It's I don't know. I just love the idea of women printers running a business in the 17th century and early. I just think that's fabulous. <laughs> I don't know. I teach women's studies too, by the way. Should say that. <laughs> Thank you so much for all <laughs> of that, Jacqueline, and for your enthusiasm. That's just wonderful. Um, we don't, we're not particularly strong in children's literature at UCL, although I'm sure we have some titles. But what I would suggest is that we put your um, research topic on our um, post it up to our volunteers and see if anyone has found anything relevant. Would that be helpful? Oh yes, because I have a modest um, website based at Penn State University Rare Books, mm -hmm. and um, and I can send you the link. I'm not very comfortable with this chat stuff, but I can send you the link of it. And it's bona fide. Like I had a tiny grant, you know, to start it to hire graduate students until I graduated. And then now it's just me, basically. So I could maybe give you that. That would be a that's something I've done. And it's got a union catalog of no one. I mean, it's not full, but I could send you that. That would be fantastic. Thank you very um, much indeed. Okay. So um, I apologize for my incompetence on Zoom. <laughs> And thank you for letting me talk. <laughs> this is so exciting to meet other women interested in these um, topics. <laughs>
Well, it's so exciting for us to to meet you across the um, borders. <laughs> I've put our contact um, email address there. And I'd like to say not only such a huge thank you to Sarah and to Steph and all of our other volunteers, but also a plea that if anyone has any paid work that um, our volunteers can now use their skills towards, that would be really wonderful. Um, obviously, we hope to hang on to them ourselves, um, but but that does depend on us um, having having some funding and, and, and how we're able to take this project forward. Um, but we now know that we can get a huge amount of information out of our catalogue records if we've got volunteers with the skills that you've that you've seen in in today's talk. Um, thank you so much, um, Jacqueline. Now, uh, we've got a question from I'll just take you off there, Jacqueline, a question from Madeline. Um, Madeline, again, the same thing, if, if you'd like to um, show up on the recording do switch your video on and we can we can fetch you up otherwise uh, you can unmute yourself or i can read out your question from the chat so oh are you there madeline Okay, so I'm going to read um, Madeline's question out here, which is really interesting. I think this, this gets to the heart of a uh, lot of the points that um, Steph and Sarah were talking about. She says, how much do you find yourself battling against the mistakes or the prejudices of the librarians who originally categorised those books when they first came into the UCL collections? And do you find that sources can be mislabeled or that provenances tend to assume that authors are men and um i would just i'll just speak before we uh, i put that to, to to steph and to sarah to say yes um of course you say categorize so what um steph and sarah were looking at with with rare books classification and catalog description or separate activities what they were looking at were the descriptions of the books in the catalogue records. Sara was using classification. She was looking at the Dan those books classified in the Dante collection and those books classified in the Castiglione collection. Although we've actually put some little search tags in the Dante books. So that pulls up all books on Dante, even if they are classified in other collections. So that's the categorising, the classification. In terms of the description, the catalogue records for the printed books, I think we already have seen that there might be in a, some assumptions being made. I would say it's more often that there's a lack of information. Steph, I was really interested in your points that you, first of all, how you identify the techniques you use to identify women's names in the catalogue. And secondly, if you could say a little bit more about this point that once you've found the names, how do you find out anything more about them? And presumably the catalogers are in the same situation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, of course, the catalog that is currently online isn't the original library catalog of when when the library was was given or, or um, received books. Um, so obviously people like Tabitha have actually gone through and Done professional cataloging, so I didn't find, I didn't get any sense of sort of mistakes or prejudices in 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 that sense. Um, Tabitha, you were fantastic in giving me basically the list of all the provenance statements um, available in the entire catalogue, which goes on and on. Um, when I, it's a spreadsheet, and when I scrolled through to about forty thousand prominent statements I just gave up so there's there's what you know there's even more than 40,000 um, and uh, what I did was so I didn't really actually use the, the catalogue was actually a sort of a secondary source for me because that prominent statement list was the most important thing um, and as I said at the beginning of my talk obviously a lot of people um, would just put initials so you just have no idea um, 
you know, who they are at all. Um, and there was one example in the paper um, of joint ownership, wasn't there, of Steph and Hannah Carling. Um, so obviously my name's Steph, short for Stephanie. Um, so I suppose it's possible that it could have been a, a Stephanie and a Hannah Carling. Um, so I suppose there's a little um, me just presuming that it was more likely to be Stephen um, and Hannah, um, but that may well be wrong. Um, trying to find who, uh, trying to identify who these women were from those provenance statements um, is very much, um, the internet is a wonderful thing. <laughs> and, um, you know, you, you just have to start by typing in their name. Um, you know, of, of course, just because there's a name of someone in a book um, uh, and perhaps they've, you know, Anne, Anne Heather 1670, that's really helpful because obviously we've got the date, but, but of course an owner can be anywhere between the, the, the publication of, of the book, let's say in 1650, right through till today. Um, so you can't just presume that this, this woman book owner of, um, of a 1650 copy of whatever bought it in 1650 or in 1651. I mean, they may well have owned it in, in the 19th century. Um, there are wonderful databases that you can start off with, like David Pearson's um, book owners online. Um, although David says himself in his recent uh, monograph that whilst there are hundreds of uh, names on the database, there's only something like 60, 40, 40 or 60 um, women's names. So um, there's a very, very small percentage of women on, on the database. Um, and again, as I said, the, the, there's a real issue with biographies that you may find that there was an Elizabeth married to, you know, a, a, a Robert um, Smith. Um, and therefore you can work, you know, you can sort of hopefully piece something together. But of course, um, I suppose Smith is a really bad example, but there are <laughs> loads of Smiths. Um, and that's where the, the rich example comes in, Mary Rich and Margaret Rich. Um, you know, even, even the great bibliophile um, Charles Ogden presumed that it, it meant the Countess of Warwick. Um, I don't think that there's any um, evidence that it is Mary Rich, but then I'm not a, um, you know, I haven't seen any of any other of books owned by Mary Rich to see how she uh, wrote her name or if she included book plates or, or however she ascribed ownership. Um, so it could well be Mary Rich, but then comes the confusion of, well, what about Margaret Rich? Where does she fit into the family? And this other, this marriage between a Robert and Elizabeth in 1616. So there, there are always lots of questions. And um, I think it's easier to ascribe ownership to men uh, a lot of the time, but not always. Um, but I think it's really hard to be 100% certain either way, unless you have something like a book plate that you can really, um, you know, say these are the Coates farms. But then of course you're looking at gentry and aristocratic families who could afford things like book plates. Um, and then you have a skewed sense of book ownership um, and you forget all the sort of, you know, middling classes who owned books as well. So it's a, it's a really tricky thing of sort of detective archival work um, where you could just hope to get as much information as possible and just provide an example of who this might possibly be. Um, but it might not, <laughs> might, might not be them at all, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. I don't know if we have anyone out there who um, might be able to help Steph with the Countess of Warwick as opposed to other possible people with the same name. Um, what we don't know, um, just to follow up a little bit on um, um, Madeline's question, what we don't know is the prejudice that might have not added those names into the catalogue. Um, I quite recently put together a collection of historical English dictionaries, not the big names, because those are in our more prominent 
collections, but ordinary family household dictionaries, and they do have a lot of names, men and male and female names, and sometimes just surnames. Um, and my feeling is that simply a, a name at some point that's not identifiable and not known might in the past not have been added to the catalogue record, even by a cataloguer who was recording provenance. And of course, recording provenance is something relatively recent in cataloguing practice, I think. Um, and there's been a lot of work done recently on the invisibility of um, of names of people who aren't upper class, aren't middle class, aren't known about, aren't prominent. Um, and that's not just a gender issue, that's also an issue of uh, um, e economic visibility. And I think that's very, that's very important. Um, we've got a nice comment from Vanessa, who said that um, when she was trying to help staff, Steph track down the Rebecca Makata um, reference, there were some reference sources that didn't even give the wife's name. They would just say he married a daughter of X. Um, yeah, and I think I think that's the way um, in which we might be battling historic historic prejudice, even when the name is is recorded. Of course, if it's a surname, that that doesn't really help us. So I've got a question for you both. Um, we're coming to the end of this first phase and you've both been working on the women's strand and by the way we have a, another talk next week in this series next tuesday lunchtime looking at early modern women authors who were collected by our 19th century collectors so do book for that but we will be looking at evaluating this project and how we can take it forward on as a volunteer project there are also bits of work that I think um, could benefit from um, more focused um, and paid work and more or more research for people who've, who've got the um, ability to do that. And I just wondered um, where you th which areas of what you've discovered do you think more research needs doing in these collections? Um, shall, I start, shall I start with you, Steph? Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, I suppose, firstly, it's worth knowing that, um, obviously, I said with that spreadsheet, you know, there are loads and loads still to go through uh, in the UCL catalogue. Um, I was really struck that when I was doing research on these various um, women book owners, that someone like the Countess of Warwick, who's the, the Mary Rich example, um, has these manuscript diaries in the British Library uh, that span a whole 11 years um, where she really details what she's reading um, and I can't find any any study that's actually looked at, at that at all which in today seems really sort of odd that no one's uh, no one's done that so far um, I think the, the main research issue with um, with researching with these women book owners who we, we don't know very much about is that there are just so many different avenues that you can go down to um, hopefully find, you know, this one small piece of information um, about them. Because of course you've got potential probate inventories. Um, you've got the marginalia in the books themselves, which is a remote project. It's, a, it's quite hard for volunteers to, um, to actually look at the actual book. Uh, there might be diaries, letters, sales catalogues, all sorts, um, which might not be in the names of the women, but might be in the names of you know, husbands, brothers, cousins um, in archives across the country. So it's a it's a really tricky one to. I mean, it's, it's basically trying to find a, a needle in a haystack, <laughs> to be completely honest. Yeah, yeah, but it's, it's definitely worth doing um, if, if you don't mind me saying that. Uh, over the last couple of years, I've been doing quite a lot of, I'm based up in Carlisle, and I've been doing quite a lot of work at Kendall Archive Centre on a project looking for um, ownership, evidence of ownership of musical goods, um, so, you know, musical books and musical instruments, which um, is, is just like that, looking for a needle in a haystack. Um, and I've spent days and days at Kendall Archive Centre 
And I think it was on the last day I found this one piece of evidence, which has meant that my, you know, I, I can basically write an entire book <laughs> based on this one piece of evidence. Uh, but, it, you know, so it's definitely worth doing that archival research, uh, but it, it does take time. And I think that's a very good example. We have at UCL Special Collections, we have just brought out the first volume of a new online journal, open access online journal called Paper Trails, which specifically focuses on the process of doing research with archives and rare book collections and other collections generally. So this um, uh, detective work and the way that you get to your aunt to, to your answer that research isn't all about questions and answers that there's a lot that goes on in between and I think you've both given a really good example of that um Sara I'll just come to you but just before I do we had a very nice comment earlier on when you were looking at the um annotations to say that it looked as though they were annotations for reading aloud, Alan James. The annotation suggests that she was planning to read that passage aloud, which is a very interesting, um, interesting suggestion. So Sarah, which areas do you think could do with more research from what you've found so far? Um, first of all, uh, yes, <laughs> I, I agree with the intro. <laughs> with um, the comment Alan James made and uh, it's extremely interesting and I wanted to uh, thank Alan for suggesting it because I have no almost no knowledge of theater actresses or anything related to public reading so my mind didn't go there at all but that is a re really really interesting take on it so thank you and to answer your question Tabitha <laughs> Yes, that's the answer. Uh, there's a lot more to research <laughs> to be done. Basically, I could tell you about um, every single woman that I found and what, what's left to, to discover, which is a lot. Like Steph mentioned, um, I too have been struggling with finding biographies or any kind of biographical information about these women. They are very rare. So unless they happen to be famous popular actresses or singers uh, famous for something other than um, reading or owning uh, or designing books um, I would I didn't find much about them but the very first thing that comes to mind with more research is actually Caroline Morris because women book collectors are not very uh, very common there are a lot of women book owners and like Steph said too, uh, I have a long list of names which remained just that, names, because I wasn't able to identify these women, but there is a lot of them. Women book collectors, on the other hand, are very much rarer to find. And also I have found some discrepancies in what I was able to read in the archives about um, the library's donation, so the Marvis Library's donation to the UCL library, and what I actually found in the catalog. So for instance, um, in the minutes of uh, 1870, which was the year after James died, they, the librarian said that the library consisted of about eight to 9,000 volumes. So that's the extent of the Morris Library, but Caroline decided to donate a part of this library right after her husband died, and that part consisted of about 3,000 volumes. But in the catalog, I was only able to track down about 600. It's a very limited number compared to the full extent of the library, and that, of course, I think happened because um, I searched for the link to the Morrises, of course, uh, from the library of James and Caroline Morris bequeathed in 1869, but it doesn't necessarily mean that all the books they donated have been catalogued in the same way. So maybe their names didn't appear in every record. And that obviously would require a lot more research to find out if maybe James was the only one mentioned. I did actually find a couple of, of items where James Morris was mentioned and Caroline was not. There may be other records where neither of them are mentioned. 
there may be evidence of ownership in the book, so that obviously would require working in person. So there's a lot more that can be done remotely and in person. And I think it would be worth it to explore it further because women book collectors should be um, more praised or studied since it, I have been actually researching. That's the whole focus of my thesis for my master's dissertation is book collecting in, in, in the UK. And every single book collector I was find was a man. So women are extremely rare and I would very much like to take this opportunity to shed some, to shine some light on another female book collector. Thank you, Sarah. And I think we've all got book collecting envy with Steph's pictures of Francis Kura's um, library. I should say libraries at Eshton Hall because she had two huge rooms crammed full of books. And I think, Sarah, your experience of provenance information getting lost or separated from the physical books, which most likely um, are still part of the collections, but um, the provenance information has got lost historically. That issue of um, legacy legacy catalogue records on, or legacy data getting lost with updating catalogue records is very, very common story. And I know there are some librarians in the audience today. We've only just touched on what we can add to these catalogue records to help researchers pull up female authors, female ownership, um, to, to add um, extra information in, in note fields is, is fine, but is there some way of indexing these? Um, and I don't know if any of the librarians um, in the audience might have um, anything to add to that discussion. Um, if you do just, just unmute or type into the chat. I'd also like to thank our Head of Retrospective Cataloguing, Andrew Watson, who was a person, Steph, who ran that report to provide you with several thousand provenance statements. Um, and I have to say, I'm quite proud that UCL um, Catalog has provenance statements for so many of their records, um, given that some of those records are, are old and some are recent. So this issue of, of, of what we can do to in, uh, enhance catalogues and perhaps to, in, to index fields is, is quite a complicated one and, and one for, for another discussion. But for today, I'd like to say a huge thank you to both of you for, a, 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 apart from anything else, for a huge amount of, of effort. You've gone through so many catalogue records, but also for the expertise and the intelligent uh, techniques that you've come up with for identifying things just from a public online record. So I'd like to say to all of you out there um, that Sarah and Steph haven't done anything that isn't available to any of you. Any of you can search our catalogue if you have the time and the patience. Um, but this just shows what happens when you do that with intelligence and with, with background knowledge and with the willingness to do extra research. Thank you very much indeed. Both Sarah and Steph will be writing blog posts on our blog and I've put the link to that in the chat. So look out for that in the future. Do attend next week, next Tuesday lunchtime, when we'll be looking at 19th century collectors who spotted women authors from the early modern period, included those in their collections. And also we'll hear from a current woman collector a uh, finalist and our book collecting prize here in London University, who's going to look at women's collecting of flower, flower, floriology, flower meaning books. Um, meanwhile, um, have a good week and we'll hope to see you next Tuesday.